The post-war period was a time of progress and innovation in the development of contraceptive methods, but attitudes to women's sexuality remained stubbornly entrenched. Women's sexual pleasure was still a taboo. Women should not, it was believed, and could not in reality, safely have sex outside of marriage. Though sex within marriage was respectable, providing married women with contraception was still framed as something you would only do to preserve their health after too many pregnancies or difficult childbirths. It was not, primarily, to facilitate an enjoyable healthy sex life free from the fear of pregnancy. Back in the 50s, when I got married, the early 50s, contraception was not generally available. You could buy Johnny's, rubbers, all the things they were called in chemist's shop, but people would be ashamed to go in and ask for them. There was a Murray Stokes clinic in London that provided the cap for women, but they would only provide it for married women, or if you could prove you were about to be married. And I had a friend who was having her relationship with her boyfriend. She went and bought a curtain ring and put it on her finger before she went to marry Stokes. But really, contraception was not nice. It was not something that nice girls or nice women used. And as I say, even Stokes, which was very ahead of its time, wouldn't provide it for unmarried women. People find contraception a difficult subject because it's to do with your... Uh, it, until the pill came on the scene, it was to do with your genitals. And of course the sheath or condom um, was associated with uh, uh, VD, venereal disease, or as they call them now, sexually transmitted infections. Um, so why is it? I think that um, first of the inhibitions about sex is also about the inhibitions about women um, not being able to be uh, controlled by getting pregnant, you know, and I think that's a fear of women's independence and empowerment um, and um, their position in society. So contraception was haphazard, it was not out in the open, it wasn't available for unmarried people, and clearly we needed good contraception even before we needed abortion, but we didn't get it because it was frowned on by the church, it was frowned on by the medical profession. Contraception was not addressed in medical education, with the exception of a handful of medical schools. Considered quite separate from obstetrics and gynaecology, some students were positively deterred from any involvement in the provision of contraception. Medical students, by contrast, were often hungry for knowledge about sex and family planning and lobbied their teachers to include it in their curriculum. As far as contraception was concerned, the only time it was ever mentioned was in a lecture in psychiatry when the uh, lecturer said that sometimes um, people became anxious because of the fear of unwanted pregnancy and you could use a condom which could be washed and then used again. And we all looked at each other amazed because those weren't the kind of condoms we knew about. <laughs> um, and in our obstetrics, we had an Australian registrar who we used to call Mr. Fucking Fanner because he referred to this fucking woman, she's not going to make it, we're going to have to take her to theatre. Um, and so because of his use of this word, we thought that perhaps he would be more amenable to giving us some advice about contraception. So we said to him, Mr. Fanner, could you give us a tutorial on, on contraception? And he said, boys and girls, it's more than my job is worth to talk to you about contraception. 1958, I mean, unbelievable when you look back on it. And so we didn't get any talk about contraception. When I was at medical school, um, the one talk that we thought we might have uh, about sex took place in the physiology department where the blinds were pulled down and we thought, oh goody, sex is coming up on the agenda. 
but actually it was all about the sperm meeting the ova after it had happened, so to speak, and that was about the sum total. University College Hospital was sort of regarded as the most kind of evidence-based hospital in London, and so Professor Nixon used to take the medical students um, after dark to the Myers Stokes Clinic to learn about family planning, and he went in daylight when I got there. I can't really, in this day and age, as a woman of my age with grown-up children, I can't believe the naivety that I was hopelessly naive. I think we'd had a few sex talks at school, but contraception, the idea that... I know when I first had sex with Pete, I got no idea what was happening. This was, you know, oh my God, this is really strange. And you know, it wasn't even wonderful, it was strange. And there was no contraception. And we have had conversations, Pete and I, about this, and he was equally, although he was 21, he was equally naive. He didn't really know which, you know, I can't really excuse him for being 21. <laughs> you know. At school, it was never, ever talked about at school. Um, and no, the only thing I knew about was that a guy could wear a condom, and that was it. And then, later on, after I was married, the pill was... Um, brought into being. But no, we, we weren't, it wasn't talked about. In fact, it was a joke that at the men's barbers they'd say, do you want anything for Sunday or something? But um, no, we didn't know anything really. And certainly nothing was ever taught at school. In those days it was called heavy petting. We, we didn't do, whether we were not, we weren't as aware as girls are now today and I, I, when I hear programs on the radio about teaching sexual matters to children and I think thank God, thank God somebody is at last realising that we need to know, we need to have access to these uh, facilities because in my day there was literally nowhere you could go unless you knew. And where would you know? Who would you ask? I had nobody to ask. I couldn't ask my parents. My mother would have been horrified. It was widely understood that most doctors wouldn't provide contraception to unmarried women and so women learn to lie about fictional forthcoming weddings or pretend to be married. Even married women seeking contraception or sterilisation felt that they had to emphasise their desperation or even the health risks entailed in bearing another child in order to get the care they needed. When I went to the doctor, um, he, I think I pretended I was still married. Um, if I remember rightly, it, I think I did. I think I just told a load of lies so that I could get a cap, you see. And I said, well, in actual fact, it wasn't a lie. I did have a difficult birth because my daughter was nine pounds and I was in the hospital for about a month uh, recovering after her birth. And I thought, I said I didn't want to go through it again. And um, so he succumbed and said, then we would, arranged for me to have the cap fitted and that was and I think I went to a clinic for this he didn't do it personally he sent me to a clinic um, but it's all such a long time ago um, but that was a very good liar <laughs> I met a guy and we um, did have a relationship and actually I went to the doctor and said I wanted to be sterilised, which my doctor wasn't very happy about. But I said, look, I'm a widow and I couldn't face having another child. It was just a relief that I wasn't going to get pregnant and could have a bit of a life. 
Um, but I never told anybody. In fact, nobody knew except one friend who looked after the children while I stayed in overnight. You didn't talk, you really didn't discuss these things like they do today. The nurse said to me, take off your knickers and roll down your stockings and sit on the bench waiting for the doctor. And I thought, sit on the bench with no knickers on, you must be joking. So, you know, I was horrified. I thought, I'm not going to do that. So I rolled the stockings down, put the pants back on and sat down and waited. And I thought, God, this is a horrid place. A handful of pioneers, such as Mari Stopes, talked about the desperate plight of poor women bearing multiple children and had been providing contraception through their clinics as early as 1921. From as far back as the 1930s and right up until the 1960s, the National Birth Control Association, which became the Family Planning Association, provided contraception and lobbied for family planning to be a part of the remit of the National Health Service. Though contraception was officially restricted to married women, in reality, family planning clinics didn't always strictly enforce this rule, and by 1964, Helen Brooke had set up the first clinic specifically for young unmarried women. NHS doctors were increasingly divided between those who took an interest in providing contraception and those who were resistant to progress. In the, uh, before the Abortion Act in 67, even contraception was very, very hard to obtain. It was a little easier if you were married, but if you were not, it was really condoms, withdrawal, or abstinence, really, wasn't it? Uh, and, uh, and, and the choices were not there. Um, the Family Planning Association, to give it its due, uh, in 1960, they did start uh, uh, supplying the pill, because the pill was invented in the 1950s, and it was first marketed in the UK in 1960. Uh, but and that's a whole seven years before the Abortion Act. But in, the, in those seven years, uh, a lot of abortions happened because people couldn't, couldn't get the pill. And that would be because uh, either the GP wasn't on, si on uh, hadn't uh, felt sufficiently comfortable with it yet, uh, wasn't, uh, the pharmacies weren't supplying it yet, it was that new. Uh, FPA was ahead of the game, ahead of the curve, but, but uh, general practitioners uh, often were not. Uh, and um, the, uh, there was certainly a resistance, sometimes um, religiously based, uh, sometimes, you know, because it's a new thing, people are not adopters, doctors are not adopters of new things, all kinds of different things, and also a concern that this was a drug. It was a, not long after the thalidomide disaster, and that also worried people that people might take the pill and the baby be harmed and they'd be blamed uh, if they got pregnant. We now know, in fact, that the pill is amazingly harmless if somebody happens to get pregnant and goes on taking it. But certainly in those days people were worried. And so the pill was primarily, well it was a bit restricted uh, even to married people, but it wasn't allowed to unmarried women at all. In the 1950s there was an assumption that husbands should consent to the sterilization of their wives and this was usually obtained, but not always in Aberdeen when the woman was desperate not to have more children and the husband was, didn't care or really felt sterilization was wrong. And some of these women were sterilized even though her husband was known to object. But as time passed, it became apparent that it's only the woman that can consent to the sterilization operation. Although it's good practice for any partner she has at that time to be to be involved in the decision-making process, but he certainly doesn't have to sign the form. And this is still true today. So I began to offer women at the postnatal vi visit and after the abortion, would you, can I help you with contraception? And the common phrase was, I was just going to ask you that doctor, which was code for that I never would have done. But the consultant whom I was responsible, and was a very experienced person, I respected him, said obstetricians don't do family planning. This was probably in 1963 or something like that. So being young and rebellious, I thought, I'm going to do family planning. And of course, family planning was changing very rapidly. The pill had been 
approved in 1960. Um, Intrauterine devices were being used. I was taught how to put in intrauterine devices. I was a pioneer in that. And um, so it was an exciting time um, to enable women to control their, their fertility. The Cambridge Women's Welfare, as it was called, because the women were locked into their vision um, from between the wars, wouldn't see unmarried women unless they borrowed a wedding ring. So with a couple of other younger doctors, we got together and we f founded the Cambridge Advisory Centre for Young People. We raised some money. Uh, we had a little donation from Francis Crick's Nobel Prize. Uh, we bought a house, we ran this clinic, and we soon had thousands of women mainly getting the pill. We could offer them other things. Um, and it was very visible, it was controversial. Um, and recently in America and once in Cambridge itself, I've met people who said, Dr. Potts, and I say yes. And they've used the same words, you changed my life, because they'd come to the clinic. And I didn't change their life, but access to the pill did change their life. Because if you were, you know, somebody doing a PhD in Cambridge in the 1960s and you got your girlfriend pregnant, that's probably the end of your academic career. Or you had an early marriage and a lot of problems from that. So giving women access, I think, does change their life. And I think it's an appropriate f f phrase. So I don't do that, but making things accessible does do it. The 1967 Act was a crucial milestone on the journey to free contraception. For the first time, the law allowed doctors to provide contraception to unmarried women. In 1973, a new Act of Parliament required the NHS to provide contraception to all, but charges remained in place for some women. In 1974, Labour's Barbara Castle announced that all charges for contraception would be dropped, and a year later, Britain could boast the first free contraception service in Western Europe, accessible for all women. And it wasn't until, until after the war that family planning became more available, at least to married women. Uh, resistance to advising women who were not married remained until the early 1970s. But in the 19 60s, a bill was brought before Parliament that became law in 1967 that did provide provision for contraceptive services. But like the circulars of the 1930s, this was permissive and not mandatory. Also, it, although it was a breakthrough in the provision of family planning, it didn't actually make services available to everybody, particularly to unmarried women and to men. And it was not until the birth control campaign in the 1970 began to lobby MPs about the need to make ab abortion free in the NHS to all persons that a, an amending clause was added to one of the National Health Service Acts 1973 that did say that the NHS had a duty to provide contraceptive services for all peace p pers persons regardless of their gender and marital status. Subsequently, Edwin Brooks took the act making contraception available on the NHS. Before that time it had not it still wasn't available to unmarried women, but in fact it was putting the cart before the horse. It was the fact that abortion was legal that made Parliament agree to more contraception. Without the Abortion Act, we wouldn't have had Family Planning Acts, but clearly believing prevention is better than cure, Parliament then accepted. And I've always thought how ironic it was that we had to legalise abortion before we legalised contraception. It was only in the 1960s that the Church of England accepted contraception, even for married couples. The Family Planning Act, well, there, this was a long story, you see. It wasn't uh, a one-off situation. The Abortion Act was something different. 
Um, the Family Planning Act, it took a long while because what, what was happening was it was local communities, uh, local councils, local government that was paying for women uh, to have contraception. In some areas, they, the, the local councils would not pay for women. And it wasn't really until 1975, when, 74, 75, when the National Health Service took over uh, 1,800 clinics from the Family Planning Association that it was made widely available for women. So I think it was a, it was a long, hard slog actually to make sure that uh, it, contraception was going to be freely available. And even then, I mean, there were stories, you see, I remember a colleague, Dr. Libby Wilson up in Glasgow, um, both of us did something called domiciliary family planning where we visited women with all sorts of problems at home and we were accused of sex on the rates. So uh, local government paying for it. It's an irony to me nowadays that family planning, contraception, sexual health is being put back into uh, public health or local government and, and it worries me as to what they are now going to be doing with that when we had worked so hard to achieve it. Then there was also around that time discussion, big discussion, with the various committees of the RCGP and of the BMA and so on. I think it was the BMA committee particularly were asked, uh, could condoms be available in general practice uh, to, to just issue as part of this deal. Uh, and the BMA was quite in favour, most of them, uh, of the pill being available on the NHS. But they, they didn't like these stuffy old male doctors on the committee, the idea of condoms being available, non-medically, non-medical things, to be available through general practice you know, on the NHS. And a, a major important committee, apparently, I was told, some of these, one of these uh, uh, discussants, whoever he was, with some role in the committee, said in plenary committee, I do not like an open-ended commitment to these closed-ended devices. And of course, with the 20 people around the table, they roared with laughter. But sometimes a joke like that can carry the day, and it convinced everybody. And so they didn't do it. And ever since then, it's a fact that condoms have never been on the NHS, have they? People have to pay for them, well, except in clinics by special arrangements or surgeries by special arrangements, finding a budget or something. But it's not a mainstream product on the NHS. And I think it's rather sad. It would have been a man, wouldn't it, who would say such a thing, an open-ended commitment to closed-ended devices. I, I would like to have been a young girl now and had access to contraception. It would have made my life very, very different. I maybe would have married the same man, but you never know. I think if I'd had the pill, a lot of avenues would have, would have opened. I realised that there was something very important here, and it was allied to preventive medicine and helping women to choose when and where, how to have a baby was about the most important choice any person can make in their lives. And to enable that to happen, to provide a good service, um, became very important. I think, I think the family planning slogan, every child a wanted child, is for me the best, the best slogan there is. I can't think how terrible it must be to have a child you don't want. I, I think a woman's choice is the most important thing. And maybe I said I'd never go on a march, but I think if they ever were going to mess with family planning, you know, to a really deleterious, in a really deleterious manner, I really would march. And that's saying something, because I'm not a marcher. Mm -hmm.